Hello, I'm Dr. Ken Landa. Thanks for watching. Let's talk about tinnitus. Tinnitus or tinnitus is a very common condition associated with ringing in the ears. Actually, the word tinnitus comes from the Latin tinnere, which means to ring. It's common, it's frequently a work-related disability. According to the Veterans Administration, it's one of the most prevalent service-related disabilities there is. The definition of the condition? Well, it's a perception of sound that you hear in the head that doesn't arise from any external environmental cause. You just hear this noise. Many individuals, maybe up to three quarters of the individuals with tinnitus, not unduly troubled by it. They don't even seek medical care. But about 3% of the people are moderately annoyed and 1.5% are severely annoyed. And somewhere between a half percent and 1% complain of such severe problems that it negatively impacts their ability to carry on a normal life. Now, tinnitus affects somewhere between about 10 and 15, maybe even up to 20% of the general population. Seems to occur basically at the same incidence everywhere in the world, whether we're talking about the United States or Africa or Asia. And that's important when we consider what some of the supposed causes are. Intermittently, it affects probably everybody. It's just kind of like you have low back pain for a while. Well, you're probably going to have tinnitus for a while. In the general population, as I mentioned, the incidence is somewhere between 10 and 15 or 20 percent, but if we go to an audiology clinic, it's probably 85 percent. And people who are completely deaf, 75 percent, still note tinnitus, more common in men than in women. It's frequent in childhood, but even though it probably occurs at the same incidence as it does in adults, children seem to be less distracted by it prevalence of tinnitus seems to increase, increases over time between the ages of 40 and 70, and afterward, it may well plateau somewhat. It can occur abruptly, but usually it develops insidiously. It can be either intermittent or continuous, it can improve over time, and whether it really improves or whether it's just you're less bothered by it is unknown. It can last for years to decades. It can be in one ear or both ears. Typically, it's located centrally within the head. Typically, it involves both ears or the left ear more than the right ear. You perceive, in some instances, an external location, but none can be found. Traditionally, it's always been considered to be an ear problem. Tinnitus thought to be a forerunner of hearing loss. That may well be true, but some recent studies suggest that it actually is a brain issue or ends up as a brain issue. Now, the symptoms vary in intensity over time, and they increase with stress. The description of tinnitus can differ radically in the level of annoyance and the sense of an impact on a person's life, depending on what else is happening in your life, what kind of stresses you have, whether you're anxious or depressed. Most people refer to tinnitus as either a ringing or a buzzing or a hissing, maybe a roaring or a clicking or a sizzling or whistling cricket light sounds, or even rough sounds. Sometimes the sounds are rhythmical. People can experience several different kinds of tinnitus. It varies over time. He said it can be constant or intermittent. And sometimes, rarely, but sometimes, people have more complex sounds, complex sounds that are more like music or voices, but the perception is that they're indistinct, and they don't convey the same meaning, the same negative connotation as the auditory hallucinations of schizophrenia. They're telling you to do something. The tinnitus sounds don't tell you to do anything. It can be associated with, but it's not necessarily caused by anxiety and depression and insomnia and irritability. But if you happen to suffer from any of those, chances are your tinnitus is going to, at least when you're suffering from those conditions, the anxiety or the insomnia, the tinnitus is going to be relatively worse. It can be so bad sometimes that it leads people to consider suicide. Now, there are many factors that are associated with tinnitus, and hearing loss is one of them. But the association is not simple, and it's not certainly straightforward. Other possible risk factors include obesity, or cigarette smoking, or drinking alcohol, or previous head injury, 
even high blood pressure or abnormalities of your temporomandibular joint. And in some individuals, it seems that there's a genetic predisposition. So we can classify tinnitus in a number of different ways, vibratory and non-vibratory. Vibratory is a transfer of mechanical vibrations from adjacent structures inside the head into the cochlea, non-vibratory, or just biochemical changes that affect the hearing and affect the brain. Another classification would be subjective and objective. Subjective, when only you hear the noise, you hear the tinnitus, you hear the buzzing or the roaring or the clicking. By far, that's the most common. But sometimes people have what are known as objective tinnitus. And the objective tinnitus, very uncommon, but the doctor can actually hear it or somebody else can actually hear the noise that you hear. Now, for the subjective tinnitus, common problems have to do with ear-related issues. So you could have hearing loss. You could have conductive hearing loss. That means that you can't transfer the sound to the inner ear, maybe because of an external ear infection or a cerumen impaction, maybe because you've perforated your tympanic membrane, have a middle ear infusion, Maybe there's some otosclerosis where the bones in your middle ear are fused together. Or it could be a sensory neural hearing loss. It could be a disease or an abnormality of the inner ear, maybe the cochlear portion of the eighth cranial nerve, maybe exposure to loud noise, or just getting older, what we call presbycusis, that's the age-related hearing loss, or maybe because you took a medicine that damages your ear, an ototoxic medicine, maybe you're suffering from Meniere's disease. Meniere's disease, association of the tinnitus with some hearing loss and some dizziness and some vertigo, noise-induced hearing loss, that's probably the most common type of acquired hearing loss. It's irreversible, but it's preventable. Could be occupational, could be recreational. You should always use silicone earplugs if you're going to be around loud noises, even short-term loud noise. If it's loud enough, like a jet engine roaring, if you're too close, that can cause problems. And if you have the hearing loss, then that leads to the tinnitus. Meniere's disease affects more than 200,000 individuals in the country. Typically, they're over age 40. It's due to an excess of endolymph in the membranous labyrinth at the inner ear. That's got three parts. It's got the cochlea that has to do with the hearing, the semicircular canals that have to do with your balance, and then the vestibule that sits in between. Usually, Meniere's disease is a diagnosis of exclusion you have recurrent attacks of episodic vertigo. They're severe, they're unanticipated, they can last for minutes to hours. The after effects can last for several days. You can have severe attacks, and then in between the severe attacks, you can have relatively milder attacks. It tends to begin in one ear, and then in anywhere between about 10 and 40% can involve both ears. The tinnitus that's associated with Meniere's disease is due to low frequency hearing loss hearing loss of around a median of 320 hertz. You have a roaring or a buzzing sound. Hearing loss with time can go from temporary to permanent. You can have some fullness in your ear. It seems that Meniere's disease, the hearing loss, as I said, is low frequency, affects both the air conduction and the bone conduction, reduces your ability to hear by somewhere between 15 and 30 decibels you're talking in a 50 or 60 decibel range, so half of that can be lost. The typical course is fullness in the ear, then the tinnitus, then the hearing loss, then the vertigo. Maybe you have the tinnitus because you took some ototoxic medicine. Simple aspirin. If you take enough aspirin or if you take enough ibuprofen or naproxen, you could end up with tinnitus. Temporary, because then you stop the aspirin and then it seems to go away. But if you happen to take some other kind of medicine, especially the aminoglycosides, those are antibiotics that are frequently injected. Well, that could permanently damage your hearing. Same thing can happen if you take some erythromycin, tetracycline, vancomycin, tends to be shorter duration, tends not to be permanent, like with the aminoglycosides. Chemotherapy can cause tinnitus. Chemotherapy like bleomycin or cisplatin or methotrexate or vincristin, or even taking a diuretic. Maybe you have some edema of your legs. 
some swelling of your legs, and the doctor gives you some furosemide or Lasix or Bumex or Etocrine, that can cause some problems with the hearing. And same too, if you're exposed to relatively high levels of mercury or lead or some other kind of medicines like chloroquine, the drugs can affect either the hair cells of the inner ear or the auditory nerve or actually even some of the central nervous system connections. And then that leads to either hearing loss or vertigo or the tinnitus. Got to be especially cautious if you're either very young or you have liver or kidney impairment, pregnant, you have a history of hearing loss, you're exposed to loud noises. You should never take two ototoxic medicines at the same time because then you're just really looking for trouble. Sometimes the tinnitus is a result of an acoustic neuroma, that's a tumor. It can destroy the vestibular nerve, it slowly happens. After it does this, then you get the dizziness or the vertigo, sometimes mild or transient. Oftentimes, the first symptom is the tinnitus. Tinnitus, in the case of acoustic neuroma, tends to be unilateral. It's less disturbing than the tinnitus of Meniere's disease. Only after you've had the acoustic neuroma for some time does it really interfere with the hearing. You could also have, instead of the subjective tinnitus, you could have objective tinnitus. That's where the doctor or somebody else can actually hear the noise that you hear. It oftentimes is due to turbulent flow of blood in the carotid artery or the jugular venous system. Maybe it's due to spontaneous contraction of some muscles in the soft palate or in the middle ear. Rare cause, but sometimes it happens. Sometimes people develop other kind of tumors. A uh, glomus tumor. Glomus tumor is a vascular neoplasm, and you can sometimes hear the low pulsating tinnitus of this condition. Or sometimes you have spasm of some of the muscles. Maybe you have eustachian tube dysfunction, what we call a patulous eustachian tube. That's the tube that connects the ear to the back of the throat. Maybe you have some blowing sounds in the ear, coincident with your breathing, usually after significant weight loss. People com Plain that they're aware of their own voice. Symptoms seem to disappear when people lie down and have the head in a dependent position or when they perform a Valsalva maneuver. That's the straining as if you were going to go to the bathroom. Other issues that can cause some tinnitus or meningiomas and multiple sclerosis or epilepsy or migraine or head injury or loss of consciousness, metabolic changes like diabetes and hormone changes can be a result of psychogenic factors or maybe some sort of connective tissue disease like rheumatoid arthritis or lupus. So if we look at the etiology overall, it seems that maybe about a quarter of the time it's due to prolonged noise exposure, about 20% of the time it's due to some sort of head and neck injury, maybe whiplash, maybe some sort of trauma, you fell, skull fracture. 10% of the time an infectious disease of some sort, 10, 15% some drug, and 40% of the time it's really unknown why you have the condition. Could be related to anything I mentioned or some hyperthyroidism or hypothyroidism or anemia or vitamin B12. We don't really have a good handle on why people develop tinnitus in the majority of cases. Generally, it's a more severe situation if it's a pulsatile tinnitus that has to do with the blood flow either in the veins or in the arteries, or if it's unilateral, it tends to mean maybe acoustic neuroma, maybe it's tinnitus associated with some other kind of ear symptoms. Well, who can perform the examination? Typically, you could see the family doctor, the internist, the ear, nose, and throat doctor, a neurologist, or even a psychiatrist if you're bothered by anxiety or depression routine examination, questions about how do you sleep, how's your concentration, what's the emotional impact, what has it got to do with the quality of life, and then we have some questionnaires. They're of limited clinical use. They have the tinnitus handicap inventory and the tinnitus functional index, and there's the Beck depression inventory and the Beck anxiety inventory. Those give us a clue as to what's going on in your life. We find out about the age you were when the condition started, whether you were exposed to loud noise or head trauma, 
look in the ear, make sure there's not cerumen that's impacting it, maybe you have otitis media. Find out whether it's episodic, like it would be in Meniere's disease, or is it a continuous situation. Do a tuning fork examination to localize the problem, holding the tuning fork on the forehead or the nose or the chin, and on the mastoid bone, and then in front of the ear to see how you hear. Sometimes blood evaluations, maybe a thyroid hormone check or a blood count to make sure you're not anemic or check the blood lipids, but rarely do you need a full ENT evaluation or a CAT scan or an MRI. Audiology examination may be appropriate, but usually doesn't really add all that much tympanometry to identify some middle ear problems or changes in the tympanic membrane stiffness might be appropriate. Pure tone audiometry might give us a little bit of a clue, but the problem with the audiometry is that it really measures between 250 and 8,000 hertz when the problem tends to be really due to higher frequency, somewhere between 8,000 and 20,000 hertz. And that can't be measured on the routine examinations. We're unable to detect the loss up in these ranges. And that's where everything starts. And then it gradually, typically, goes down into the higher frequencies that can be tested. And we only test at specific frequencies. So it's if in between the frequency, we're going to miss it. And it would appear that acute loss of auditory input, that can lead to some tinnitus, can be associated with some apoptosis or some death of the cochlear hair cells. But the tinnitus persists even after we cut the auditory nerve, so it doesn't have any connection to the ear anymore, and people still have the tinnitus. So it's thought that maybe actually the central nervous system is the cause of the tinnitus, the source of the tinnitus. So it might be that it started off with some lack of input from damaged cochlear hair cells in the inner ear, or maybe it had to do with some sort of an abnormality of the auditory nerve leading to the central nervous system. And this seems to be able to alter the auditory complex, the auditory cortex. So it's possible that the problem can originate in the cochlea, inside the ear, but later on, over a period of time, due to increased excitability and decreased inhibitory action, then it can end up self-generating in the central nervous system. And it can have to do with an abnormality of some neurotransmitters and neuromodulators. And all of those things tend to change some of the voltage-gated channels with the sodium and the potassium and the calcium inside the brain. And that means that we can have basically the same sort of problem that occurs after an amputation. Let's say you have your foot amputated, if you're unfortunate enough to have that happen. Well, a lot of people still complain of sensations in the foot. Well, there isn't any foot. But the sensations are arising in the central nervous system. And it's due to the plasticity of the central nervous system. And that seems to have a lot to do with the, at least the generation and the continuation of the tinnitus. And it's not only the central nervous system that's related to the hearing, not just the auditory complex, but then the auditory complex has a broad array of connections to the frontal lobe and the prefrontal emotional centers and the parietal lobes and the limbic system. And all of those can be changed. So what is the origin of tinnitus? And the answer is we don't know, but it would appear to be about a quarter of the time the inner ear, maybe a third of the time the acoustic pathways, and maybe 40% of the time those brain networks I just talked about. So how do we treat it? That's the difficult question. There is no Food and Drug Administration and there is no European Medicines Agency approved treatment. The goal is simply to improve the quality of life, not to achieve a cure. 
No treatment at the present time can be guaranteed to work better than an inactive placebo. And the treatments that are preferred differ in different countries. Nobody has a solution to the problem and it remains a clinical and a scientific enigma. We explain the situation to individuals. We give them some intervention to decrease the distress. We try to improve the quality of life. We decrease some of the comorbid or associated problems. We can treat the anxiety or the depression or the insomnia. And if a person has some hearing impairment, we can improve that too. A lot of people say, well, reduce stress. Mm, that's easier said than done. Some people seem to get better if they reduce the caffeine or the nicotine or they treat the allergies, but that tends not to be a major issue. In 1935, Baronet came out with nasoprocaine. Well, nasoprocaine, that's subsequently been changed to intravenous lidocaine or xylocaine. Get temporary relief in 40 to 70 percent of the people, and it shows that the central auditory system is really involved because it seems to work even after we transect the auditory nerve. Now, it might have some additional effect on the cochlea, we just don't know. But it seems that the intravenous lidocaine works on those sodium and the calcium and the potassium channels that I mentioned a moment ago. Now, some people take medicines like the tricyclic antidepressants nor tryptoline. It's okay if you're depressed, but it probably is not going to give you any benefit if you're not. And along the way, it's going to cause a dry mouth and blurred vision, and it's going to cause you to have difficulty urinating, especially if you're an older man or tends to cause constipation. Some people use the SSRIs, the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, Prozac and Zoloft and Paxil. But those drugs might bring forth other kind of issues. Benzodiazepines in some people, like Ativan or Xanax or Clonazepam, may help take care of some of the anxiety, but they don't really change the tinnitus. They're antispasmodics, and of course, people use gabapentin and tegretol and the motrigine for everything, including for tinnitus, and they don't work for most of the disorders for which they're prescribed. Well, sometimes people use diuretics, hydrochlorothiazide, or even Lasix, sometimes an anticoagulant or a vasodilator, beta histine. That's very popular, especially for Meniere's disease. It supposedly has something to do with the cochlear blood flow. It's approved in the European Union, but it's not approved in the United States. And actually, there's no support for the treatment. It's widely used anyway. Some people suggest melatonin or vitamin B or zinc or magnesium. None of that seems to work. They're proponents of low-power lasers or electromagnetic stimulation or acupuncture or herbs or candling or ginkgo, cognitive behavioral therapy. Well, that doesn't improve the tinnitus. It might assist with some of the anxiety or the depression, decrease the annoyance. Maybe there's relaxation therapy. You can combine all of that with sound masking therapy, but it still really doesn't work. You still have the tinnitus. It just may change whether it bothers you as much or doesn't. Hearing aids. Well, if you have hearing loss, that might be a good idea. But on the other hand, there's no evidence that hearing aids improve tinnitus. Even though many doctors fit patients with hearing aids, it amplifies the high frequency range. No benefit actually from the hearing aid. And in fact, one of the studies was done where they gave some people hearing aids and they put people on a waiting list to get the hearing aid. And actually, there was no difference between the two groups. The people that were waiting to get the hearing aid and the people who already had a hearing aid seemed to have about the same level of tinnitus, same level of improvement. There's sound therapy. Everybody talks about this masking therapy to make the tinnitus less bothersome. Well, we can provide some low-level sound and actually, it seems to make some people worse. And some of the devices that people use to provide that extra sound, the masking sound, actually can further damage the hearing. So is there any evidence? Well, it's inconclusive that it's going to be of any benefit. Brain stimulation with transcranial magnetic stimulating devices? Nah. How about the tinnitus retraining therapy? That's where you add counseling to the sound generator therapy. 
most people would believe that it's probably hype without substance, biofeedback or relaxation training. It can change the body's reaction to the tinnitus. It can train you to cope better. It can be associated with fewer negative thoughts and less annoyance. But does it change the tinnitus? No. How about surgery to ablate the cochlear nerve, to cut the cochlear nerve from the cochleus? Does that seem, no, nah, it's going to reduce your hearing. It's going to result in deafness in that side. But only 50% of the people are going to improve. And oftentimes, given a while, the tinnitus comes back either in the same ear or in the opposite ear. Well, some people believe that surgery, especially if you have the objective tinnitus, where the blood vessels are passing too close to the auditory nerve and some of the sound is caused by that, mm, surgery to cause a buffer between the two, uh, conflicting evidence at best. Cochlear implants, they might work in some people, but they might cause tinnitus in other people. So that's where we currently are with respect to tinnitus or ringing in the ears. Lots of ideas, but we don't have any good solutions. And fortunately, for most people, the extra sounds are not going to be too distressing because our current therapies are kind of like voodoo. None of them are regularly shown to be any better than placebo. They're just more costly. So if you see a practitioner who comes up with a, an expensive idea or an invasive procedure, you ought to get a second or even a third opinion. And if you get a prescription, make sure that the prescription is not going to be associated with more problems than the tinnitus. And if you get a hearing aid, make sure that you're able to return it if it doesn't work. Anyway. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please tell a friend and consider subscribing so that you'll be notified as we post new videos. As always, I appreciate your interest. I'm Dr. Ken Landau.